Alright, sorry that video got randomly cut in half. My microphone stopped working, so it stopped me from recording. Uh, so when we talk about the institutions, we'll kind of work our way down the decision tree talked about on the previous slide. Uh, so the top of the food chain, the most powerful portion of the EU kind of governing structure is the Commission. The Commission is 28 members. Each nation's government gets to appoint its own um, member of the Commission, and that member has to be approved by the uh, European Parliament. In addition to the participatory members of the Commission, this is where we also see the bureaucrat bureaucratic wing of the EU's government that has thousands of civil servants and they function in nearly identical ways to any other bureaucracy that we uh, have discussed or will discuss. Each commissioner will pick an area of policy that they tend to be skilled or knowledgeable in and they will function as like a, a cabinet minister that they su supervise you know a, a bureaucratic organization that will oversee policy making uh, the main responsibility is executive to uh, implement and oversee administration of EU law and policy just like an executive branch of any other form of government The step below them on the food chain are the Council of Ministers. The Council of Ministers are not appointed in terms of like the members of the Commission or elected like members of the European Parliament. The Council of Ministers are the head of each member country. So a Prime Minister, a President, a Premier, a you know, whoever is the um, head of government. It's those 28 individuals plus the president of the EU Commission, and they will meet at the EU's headquarters in Brussels on a regular basis. Uh, they can initiate legislation. Uh, they can enact, you know, reform or offer proposals, but their proposals don't become new law until the uh, um, council ratifies actions by the commission. Certain ministers might find reasons to meet more frequently to deal with specific issues uh, that impact them, that you can have partial meetings or specific subtopics where they meet within the council of ministers, but it's a consulting body of all of the national executives of EU member nations. The large democratic body is the European Parliament, uh, where they don't have a lot of legislative power, that most things are either put together through the Commission or the Council of Ministers, but uh, they can propose amendments to legislation proposed by either the both by I apologize for yawning loudly it's late and it was fun trying to put my child to sleep tonight uh, in this body there are 736 members that are directly elected for uh, five-year terms and they function as members of parliament function in most parliamentary democracies with less legal authority uh, in addition to being able to propose amendments to legislation, they have the ability to uh, reject some proposals from the European Council, but on a unanimous vote, they can override a parliamentary veto. The last of the institutions that we'll talk about is the European Court of Justice. It's the EU Supreme Court, and it has the power of judicial review to overturn laws and policies crafted by uh, people above them on the 
kind of hierarchical decision making chart. Uh, they're not in Brussels, they're in Luxembourg. And they function just like a Supreme Court does, but on a far larger scale. They can interpret European law, they can interpret um, the policies of member nations that come into conflict with European law, and through their use of judicial review, they can find ways to actually limit the sovereignty of member nations, which is, again, another area of complaint uh, had by some of the folks who are in favor of uh, leaving or separating from the Union. The uh, ECJ has 28 judges. Uh, each one is dominated by a member state, and then the cases are decided by a simple majority. I know that this is a quick look at kind of the the institutional elements, but I think the more important part of the EU is probably to talk about uh, policies that are a big deal. Um, if you wanted to, you could click on this link and uh, get a, a brief introduction to some of the political things that the EU deals with. Uh, but we'll talk about five or six issues. First and foremost is the proposition of the single market that, as we talked about in the history section, this is the original um, area that the EU was created to deal with, that it was the European Economic Community uh, that kind of branched into other elements or areas where they gained more power or sovereignty over time. But the goal is uh, to create a single international market and it functions as a free trade agreement like I said earlier and the goal is to decrease uh, tariffs or barriers between member nations to allow for kind of equitable economic growth. The other thing that the single market does is it sets together standards for professional licenses. So if you are licensed for a skilled position in one country, you are licensed for a skilled position in all member states. And this can be something as technically complex as a physician. Uh, comparatively, it can be as something, you know, as, as easy that still takes sort of, or easier than being a doctor that takes certification like being being a hairdresser so it creates unified kind of standards for uh professional employment so you could be a doctor anywhere in the eu based on a single certification second is the monetary policy where they think the conversion to the common currency uh, alleviates a lot of the monetary problems in the United Kingdom uh, where they want all member nations to kind of be tied to a lot of the same fiscal policies and currency controls are unilaterally easy to institute when you have multiple nations utilizing uh, the same currency. It's also easy to control the supply of money to you know, help fight inflation or deflation when everybody is a singular currency. And of the 28 nations, 26 of them utilize the euro. The two notable exceptions are uh, the United Kingdom and Sweden. Through the European Central Bank, uh, they kind of focus on policies that impact the, the national banks or the treasury departments of the individual member nations and this can be things like interest rates uh, you know loan policies anything in in that kind of realm agriculture is the next area uh, almost half of the EU's budget goes to deal with uh, modernizing farms uh, or sustainable agriculture rural development projects uh, to make European agriculture more competitive uh, with the rest of the world, primarily to compete against uh, U.S. agriculture. Defense and security issues are uh, another uh, area where there's kind of a common defense pact 
amongst the EU nations, and you've seen uh, defense as another reason why a nation like Turkey uh, has potentially been blocked in the past, that Turkey and Greece uh, both claim uh, sovereignty over the island of Cyprus, and that if Turkey and Greece were both in the European Union and there was a conflict over uh, who had you know, the, the rights to control Cyprus, that it would create kind of a, you know, civil war between EU member nations. Um, crisis management is what they focus on the, the most, uh, dealing with humanitarian issues, rescue, uh, peacekeeping tasks. Uh, you've seen kind of the, the refugee policy that they've been working on uh, over the past couple of years to deal with uh, migrants from the MENA region kind of pop up here and the goal is to kind of have a quick standing army that if there were any kind of crisis where the EU needed to actively deploy troops that they could deploy 60,000 troops within 60 days that could be uh, meaningfully supplied for a year and Here's where areas have a little, or nations have a little bit more sovereignty, where they can kind of determine the size and scope of their contribution uh, to uh, these humanitarian, peacekeeping, or military operations. Justice and home affairs are kind of the last issue. Um, the Treaty of Amsterdam kind of shifted uh, discussions of migration throughout Europe that the goal was if you were a member, uh, a European citizen uh, who lived in an EU member nation, you wouldn't need a passport or a visa uh, to move throughout European countries that you wouldn't have to apply for, you know, a new visa for short or long-term work anywhere that you could freely move throughout the 28 member nations in Europe. This involved setting a policy that not only dealt with uh, visas and asylum, but immigration and immigration as well. And you see a lot of nations kind of flag this as another infringement on uh, their sovereignty. And then the last area that's kind of more developing over time is an anti-terror policy as you're seeing more um, acts of terror kind of pop up throughout Europe or kind of the continuation of the American War on Terror. You're seeing people kind of ask for what kind of role the EU plays or should play in this area of policy. The last uh, kind of list of things we need to look at are kind of contemporary challenges that the EU is dealing with and there are a handful that some of them are small potatoes, some of them are relatively big. Um, while the EU has the ability to kind of constantly expand, take on new member nations who are willing to kind of meet the criteria or adopt the legal policies, uh, you're seeing some growth fatigue or en enlargement fatigue that people are really kind of weary of adopting more uh, or bringing in more member nations. And a lot of the fears here are actually economic in nature that you have, you know, several non-member nations that are struggling economically and they're afraid that bringing them into the fold, bringing them into the euro will drag down any kind of economic growth. Second, you're seeing kind of the people talk about a democratic deficit, that there is too much power being given to the Commission or the European Parliament, and you're seeing uh, more and more citizens of individual nations kind of uh, afraid or angry that they're losing some sovereignty. And this is where you kind of see the, the birth and the spread of Euroscepticism, the idea that uh, people are kind of skeptical of this one European vision that's been in the works since the end of World War II, and that people are feeling like individuals are less accountable, 
that their member nations are less accountable because if you're a member nation of the European Union and you're, you know, you support or are coerced into a policy that's unpopular with your citizens, you can just pass the buck on to the, the larger European entity. And, you know, Euroscepticism is popping up all over the place. It's the birth of the Brexit movement in um, the United Kingdom. You are seeing people kind of cite the same rhetoric, you know, the rise of Marie Le Pen in, in France and kind of the rebirth of French populism or nationalism uh, has brought forth some Euroscepticism. You saw this happen in Iceland when a new wave of parliamentary elections led to them withdrawing uh, their bid for membership in the organization and that this is kind of the, the next grand challenge for the European Union to deal with how to settle the issue of Euroscepticism. There's a constitution for the EU, and some of the member states uh, did not ratify the 2007 Lisbon Treaty that changed some structural elements of the European Union, so there are questions as to whether or not uh, the, the current iteration of the government has uh, aspects of legitimacy uh, from a rational or legal perspective, since member nations are not signing off uh, on, on these changes. You're seeing cleavages pop up between big state, small state, between industrial versus agricultural states, between wealthy, wealthy and poor states, high and low GDP or GMP states, and that this is creating problems. And this is where you saw like um, Germany and German citizens start getting upset with the rest of the EU when Germany in a relatively strong economy was being asked to kind of shoulder the burden of weak economies or struggling economies or high debt economies like Greece, Spain, or Ireland. And you're you're seeing these challenges again fuel the fire of Euroscepticism that uh right, if I am a politician from a nationalist perspective, it's easy for me to demonize, you know, my European brother and sister nations that are economically struggling and if we want to say that they're dragging us down and we have to support them financially and we could do other better things with that money it's kind of an easy argument to uh, construct the the big one and some of this has kind of evolved since the the last time I updated this uh, slideshow last last semester is the the quota for dealing with refugees a plan proposed by germany uh originally was to deal with kind of resettling uh migrants from you know war-torn areas from the syrian civil war people kind of fleeing political civil or economic persecution and that europe said they would take them in um in principle, uh, 22 of the 28 countries agreed to kind of share the burden of 160,000 refugees, and people were not necessarily um, happy with or on board with this decision that people make the kind of traditional anti-immigrant arguments that they destabilize society, that some of them could be terrorists, that they're going to take jobs, rob economic opportunities not contribute so people have kind of gotten upset with the proposals to kind of take on uh, more and more immigrants and you saw kind of the argument for the construction of these large uh, immigrant reception centers that would be refugee camps and or like detention centers to vet people um, and the movement was kind of to do it in places outside uh, of Europe or to kind of push it off on some of the people who are trying to get in the good graces of the EU to have a membership bid um, approved. And, you know, you've seen some success with this kind of policy on the Greek-Macedonian border. But you've seen some failure 
uh, with this problem as well because they're really just kind of outsourcing the problem to another nation where, you know, if a refugee is bound and determined to enter the EU, they're going to find a way. That's why we've seen, you know, uh, all of these kind of rickety ferries and boats kind of sink. You've seen, you know, thousands of people die amidst the refugee crisis because they're trying to flee somewhere better, and the EU is kind of attempting to restrict the flow of immigration because they don't know what they want their policy to be, or member nations are kind of blocking the actions of the supranational organization. If you're interested in uh, a handful of other videos to watch, you can look at uh, these links that are shared in the slideshow on Classroom. You can look for some additional resources that are on my uh, website, remysapgov.weebly.com. Um, because I think, you know, I could record a lecture on the European Union every day. And given the wave of European elections that are happening throughout the spring of 2017, given the, you know, ever present threat of the British Parliament invoking Article 50 to withdraw from the European Union, that these things could change um, in an instant. And I think this is kind of the, the great challenge that Europe is dealing with. Has the European Union been uh, a successful economic model? Has it done more harm than good? Has it limited the sovereignty of individual member nations too much? That I think these are questions that people are still going to grapple with for for quite some time and I honestly think once we see how this wave of European elections throughout this year uh, kind of pan out we can kind of determine the the future you know life expectancy of the European Union